Thank you for downloading this episode of our podcast. Hi, and welcome to the podcast for Solomon Staircase Masonic Lodge number 357, where we talk about all things related with Freemasonry, including hermetic teachings, philosophy, reason, spirituality, and much more. We're located in Buena Park, Southern California. Tune in as we continue to update our podcast with informative talks and articles for Masons worldwide and those who would like to inquire within. Okay, we are back to Mackey's Revised History of Freemasonry, Chapter 49, Early Freemasonry in France. With the condition of Freemasonry in Gaul, a province that afterwards became France, following upon the decay of the Roman Empire, and on up to the Middle Ages, we are by no means as familiar as we are with its circumstances during the same period in Germany and in Britain. French Masonic writers have been too speculative in their views, they have given too free a rein to their imaginations to permit us to attach great value to the authenticity of what they present as historical statements. This is a fault, but it is fair to say that it has been shared by the English writers of what has been called Masonic history. Clavel and Thorey are hardly to be considered more reliable as historians than Anderson and Oliver. In the works of each of these noted writers, we find statements which are improbable and which, although offered as historical facts, are wholly unsupported by any authentic authority. But since their time in England, a new school of Masonic history has sprung up, one that is rapidly clearing away the cobwebs of absurdity and inconsistency of doubt and error which had been woven around the pure form of history by the old writers of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. In France, no such school has been popular. That country has lacked Hugens, Woodfords, and Lyons to bring to light from their hiding places on the shelves of national or private libraries the old charters and documents which might throw some light on the real condition of the Masonic fraternities left behind in Gaul on the retreat of the Roman legions, and which were afterwards developed by a gradual but steady growth into the building corporations of the Middle Ages. If the scholars of France supply us with too little valuable assistance in our inquiries on the subject, we shall look in vain for aid from English or German writers. These have, in general, thought it a task sufficiently difficult in seeking to clear up the Masonic history of their own countries, and have not, therefore, found either time or inclination to labor to any great extent in other fields. Even Findel, who was somewhat exhaustive in his account of the early and medieval Freemasonry of Britain, and more especially of Germany, passes over that of France without notice. Indeed, he begins his chapter on French Freemasonry with the year 1725 as his starting point. Thus, he entirely overlooks all the events that preceded the organization of the modern lodges in Paris after the Revival, as it is called, which took place in London in the year 1717. Hence, his history is not really that of Freemasonry in France, but only that of the French Grand Lodge. From Kloss, another German writer of note, we get no better information. He wrote in two volumes a history of Freemasonry in France, drawn from authentic documents. But his theory is that the institution was introduced into France from England. He goes, like Findel, no farther back than to the organization of a French lodge in 1725 under the wing of the Grand Lodge of England. It will be seen when we come to consider the origin of the Grand Lodge of Speculative Freemasons in France that there is some question of the correctness of this date, for the researches of Brother Hugen have led to doubt whether there was a legal lodge in France deriving its authority from the English Grand Lodge before the year 1732. This, however, is not related to the present inquiry. It is altogether in vain that we look in the pages of French Masonic writers such as Thorey and Clavel for any documentary history of French Freemasonry before the beginning of the 18th century. Thorey, in his Acta Latimorum, commences his annals, so far as they relate to France, with the year 1725 and the founding of a lodge in Paris by the Earl of Derwentwater. Not a word does he say of the condition of the association, either as operative or speculative, previous to that date. Clavel, in his History Pittoresque, gives a very loose and indefinite account of the origin of Freemasonry in France. He traces it, and insofar he is correct, to the Roman Colleges of Artificers through the architects of Lombardy, and passes very rapidly on to the connection of the French operative Freemasons with the building corporations of Germany and the Grand Lodge of Strasbourg. <laughs> 
but he does not attempt to show how that connection was effected. There is no objection to Clavel's theory. His principal fault, as a historian, lies in his very general outlook and his limited details. Taken as his point of departure the Roman colleges, he leaps almost at one jump from them to the medieval corporations. He devotes no attention to the period which immediately followed the fall of the empire, nor to the influences exerted on, or the methods pursued by, the Roman and Gallic Freemasons who were left in Gaul on the leaving of the legions, and which led to the gradual deployment of the guilds, fraternities, or lodges, which sprang up in time as the successors of the Roman colleges. Another failing of Clavel as a historian, and one of which produces the most unsatisfactory results upon the minds of his readers, is that he produces no documents, does not even refer to any, and he gives no authority to support any of the statements that he makes so confidently. Even in a writer of acknowledged care and attention to the trustworthy quality and genuineness of the facts that he records, such a method of treating a historical account would be objectionable. But what little claim Clavel's unsupported assertions have to our respect, and how far they are from necessarily demanding our belief, may be learned from the fact that he cites as an undoubted instance of the existence of a Masonic Lodge in the year 1512 what is now known to have been a merely a convivial society of literary men who met at Florence in that year under the title of the Society of the Trowel. This society counted some of the most distinguished inhabitants of Florence among its members. Its symbols were the trowel, the square, the hammer, and the level, and its patron saint was St. Andrew. Vasari describes it as a festive association of Florentine artists who met annually to dine together. He says the origin of its existence and its title was due to the merely accidental circumstance that certain painters and sculptors dining together in a garden observed in the vicinity of their table a mass of mortar in which a trowel was sticking. Some rough practical jokes passed thereupon, such as casting portions of the mortar on each other, and then those present called for the trowel to scrape it off. They then resolved to dine together annually, and as a memorial of the comical event that had led to their organization as a dinner club, they called themselves the Societa de la Quecheria, or the Society of the Trowel. The mention of a tool of the operative Freemasonry in the title of the society led Clavel, as it had done Rigolini, Lenning, and some others, to believe that it was a Masonic organization. But a reference to the authority of Vasari in his Lives of the Painters would have shown that the apparently professional title was actually selected by a mere accident and in reference to a joking affair which suggested the name. There is hardly any necessity to refer to the writings of the Chevalier Ramsay as throwing any light on the early history of Freemasonry in France. The theory credited by many to Ramsey is that Freemasonry started among the Crusaders and was brought into France by the Templars, who carried it with them on their return from Palestine. This theory is now generally, perhaps we should say universally, admitted to be unsound. It comprises a history, or the fiction of a history, not founded on facts, nor supported by any documentary evidence, but one that was simply invented to sustain a preconceived theory. The theory was first invented, and then the history was written. Hence it has been rejected by all students and has fallen into utter inaction together with the system of strict observance that was founded on it. In this work of ours, which seeks to trace Freemasonry back to the Colleges of Artificers of Rome, it can of course have no place. Ribold is a pleasing exception to the rest of his countrymen who have treated or attempted to treat this subject, though it is to be regretted that he has not thought proper to back up his statements by a reference to authorities, or by what would have been most valuable, the mention in detail of any old records or constitutions. On the whole, however, he is more satisfactory than any other writer of early French Masonic history, and gives a fuller account of the institution as it existed when Gaul left the control of Rome. His history, summed up briefly, is to the following effect. He says that Freemasonry was introduced into Gaul by the Roman fraternities of builders, one of which was attached to each legion of the army. He describes the troubles to which these architects were subjected during the repeated conflicts of the Romans with the savage nations, whose defeats or successes were followed by the destruction or the renewal of the labors of the Freemasons. At length, in the year 426, the victorious army of Clovis, king of the Franks, put an end to the Roman control, and the armies of the empire left forever the soil of Gaul. But the fraternities of builders, which had come into the country with the Roman legions, remained there after the leaving of the soldiers. 
They, however, underwent material alterations in their organization and developed a new system. This, Rebold thinks, became the basis of that Freemasonry which existed for a long time afterwards in France. Moeller, in his Memorials of German Gothic Architecture, when referring to the fact that the Roman architecture of the 5th and 6th centuries prevailed at a much later period in Italy, Spain, Gaul, and Britain, explains the circumstance as follows. Quote, the conquerors did not wipe out the old inhabitants, but left to them exclusively, at least in the first periods of their invasion, the practice of those arts of peace upon which the rude warrior looked with contempt. And even at a later time, the intimate connection with Rome, which the clergy, then the only civilized part of the nation, entertained, and the unceasing and generally continued use of the Latin language in the divine service, gave considerable influence to Roman arts and sciences. This must have been so much more the case from the constant obligation of all freemen to devote themselves to war, whereby the practice of the arts was left almost exclusively to the clergy." End quote. The corporations of builders, which had been attached some to the legions and some to the governors of the provinces, under whose orders they had constructed many great edifices, then began to admit into their bosom a large number of native Gauls who had been converted to Christianity. A most important change, however, to which they were compelled to submit, was this, that being originally a general association of artisans, whose central sect and school of instruction was at Rome, they were obliged to abandon this relation on the retreat of the Roman armies of Ga from Gaul, and thus cut off all political connection between the province and the imperial government. The builders, as well as the other craftsmen, then divided themselves into a variety of fraternities, each being occupied with the practice of a different art or trade. It is here that Rebold should have cited some authority for his statement of a fact that is contrary to what has always been supposed to be the true character of the Roman colleges. The division into different trades, which he supposes to have been a forced necessity in Gaul, was in existence, if history to be correct, from the first organization of the colleges by Numa, when they were ten in number, which was later on increased to a large extent under the empire. These brotherhoods of different trades, he says, later gave rise to the corporations or guilds of the Middle Ages. Of these fraternities, that of the builders or Freemasons being the most important and the one most needed in the countries where they were left after the departure of the Romans, especially in Gaul and Britain, was alone enabled to keep up the old organization and the ancient privileges they had possessed under the control of the Romans. But amid the continued attacks of savage foes and the wars and political disturbances that followed, the fraternities of builders were at last everywhere without occupation. The arts and architecture among them, paralyzed by international contests, found a refuge only in the houses of the church, the monasteries, where they were successfully practiced and encouraged by the monks and the ecclesiastics who had been admitted into the fraternity of Freemasons. Among the most celebrated architects of France who were the products of those monastic schools of architecture, Rebold mentions St. Eloi, Bishop of Noyon, St. Ferriol of Limoges, Dalmac of Rhodes, and Agniola of Chalons, all of whom flourished in the 7th century. But he says that there were among the laymen outside this class of church officials also architects not less noted, under whose direction many edifices were built in Gaul and in Britain at a later period. Most famous of those whom Rebold has described as architects and as the disciples of the monastic schools of architecture was St. Eloi, or Elegius. But St. Eloi was not an architect, but a goldsmith, having regularly served an apprenticeship to that trade, even after his appointment by Clothair II to the position of treasurer or master of the mint. Later, when 52 years of age, he was raised to the bishopric of Noyon, for which he was obliged to prepare himself by two years of study and admission to certain orders of the church. As a church leader and high official, he patronized, as many others had done, the architects by the erection of churches and monasteries. But his connection with operative Freemasonry is rather through the guild organizations than through any close connection with the craft of building. He organized the monks of his abbey, according to St. Croy, into a guild or school of smiths, for whom he drew up a code of regulations. According to the same authority, these statutes for the government of the craftsmen of Paris, prepared in the 14th century by Stephen Boileau, were but a transcript of those of St. Eloi. Ray Eloi. Whittington says that St. Eloi belonged properly to the class of professional artists who were richly favored and held in high esteem by him.
The writer of his life in the Spicolegium describes him as a very skillful goldsmith and most learned in all the constructive arts. It is very evident that Rebold has so far given us the early history of architecture in France rather than that of Freemasonry. In this respect, his work follows in its spirit that of Dr. Anderson in the first and especially in the second edition of the Book of Constitutions. To the student of Masonic history, such annals are of a value only because of the traditional relations that exist between the operative and speculative systems. Well-authenticated history leaves us no room to doubt that the Romans brought architecture into France, or, to speak more correctly, into Gaul at a very early period. Many remarkable ruins are still remaining in the older cities of Arles, Avignon, Nimes, and other ancient places, which are the fragments from the labors of builders and architects under the Roman control. In fact, when the less civilized nations began their trips into Gaul, the land was covered with the monuments of Roman art. Many of these were destroyed, but there still remained in the 6th century a great number of public and private edifices which had been spared. In fact, there is at Nimes a temple and an aqueduct still remaining in a state of excellent preservation. The former is now used as a museum of antiquities, and the latter, known as the Pont du Gard, is solid and strong and is admitted by scholars to be the noblest Roman monument in France. The people, during a long period of subjection to the Roman rule, was traditionally educated in the architectural taste and spirit of Rome. With the revival of the art of building construction in the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries, the Christian churches became the, but the reflection of the pagan basilica, the Hall of Justice, and the palaces of kings and the castles of nobles were but copies enlarged of the Romano-Gallic villas or country houses. French Masonic writers have, with a great claim to plausibility, assumed that the Freemasons of France were a continuation in regular and unbroken descent of the Roman colleges of artificers. This view has been strengthened by another historical fact that admits of no doubt that Charlemagne, whose name and that of his grandfather, Charles Martel, are frequently referred to as patrons of Freemasonry in the old English records, was noted for his zeal in the erection of churches and palaces, and brought many architects from Byzantium into France, founding there, or rather transplanting there, the Byzantine order of architecture, which, however, afterward gave place to the Gothic, or that order of which the medieval Freemasons were, it is generally agreed, the inventors. Rebold, as a historian, occupies a middle term between the doubting and image-breaking modern school and the easy belief of the early Masonic analysts. He says that after the final giving up of Gaul by the Romans, about the end of the 5th century, though many of the colleges of artificers which had been established under the Roman control remain in Gaul, yet their organization underwent important changes. In the first place, the general association of the various artisans who were necessary to the pursuit of architecture, religious, naval, and hydraulic, or the buildings of temples, of ships, and of bridges and aqueducts, being no longer able to maintain itself in a country abandoned by the Romans, and having lost its center of action and its principal school at Rome, no longer practiced architecture as a profession in common and under one head, but was divided into various associations, each of which occupied itself thereafter with, but the study and practice of, a single art or trade. It is in this way that he accounts for the rise of the corporations which flourished later on in the Middle Ages, and which were in a transition period between the ancient colleges and the modern lodges. These various fraternities sprang out of the general association of artisans existing under the Roman Empire, the corporation of builders or masons being the most important fraction. The latter preserved, says Rebald, their ancient organization and their ancient privileges because the countries where they resided after the leaving of the Romans, being greatly in need of their services as builders, freely accorded to them the privileges they had possessed under the Romans. The Teutonic invaders of Gaul, who were drove out the Romans, though barbarians, were wise enough not to destroy the old monuments of Roman art and civilization, but to make use and profit by them. But, in the same century, the cathedral erected by Naumidius, bishop of Avignon, surpassed that of Perpeticus. Gregory of Tours, who is a native of Avignon, describes the edifice with much eloquence of phrase in his Historia Francorum, and states the fact, interesting, as showing the connection of a high-placed churchman with operative Freemasonry, that he built it according to his own designs, Ecclesium Suo Studio Fabricavit. The inroads of the Franks into Gaul in the 6th century caused at first amid the class of war, 
while the arts of peace were silent, the injury and downfall of many religious edifices. But the conversion and baptism of Clovis placed Christianity on a firm foundation and caused the preservation of the remaining monuments of the ancient civilization. The Franks, a bold, enterprising, and warlike offshoot from the great Teutonic race, and who were the real founders of the kingdom, which afterwards became modern France, were notwithstanding their fights among themselves and their conflicts with neighboring people, inclined to practice the arts of peace. They occupied, says Dean Church, a land of great natural wealth and great geographical advantages, which had been prepared for them by Latin culture. They inherited great cities which they had not built, and fields and vineyards which they had not planted. And they had the wisdom not to destroy, but to use their conquest. The Franks were indeed friendly to Roman culture, preserved many of the Roman laws and customs, and accepted for their own use a modified form of the Latin language. Architecture, which had been dragged down during the stormy period when the Romans were unsuccessfully striving to defend their acquired provinces, and the very existence of the Roman Empire itself from the wild host of northern invaders, began in the 5th and 6th centuries to revive. The fraternities of builders and the art of architecture to some extent, says Rebold, resumed activity. The fact already mentioned elsewhere, that the art of building, especially of religious edifices, had passed into the hands of the monks, is found to prevail also in the history of the art in France at this early period. The remarks of Whittington on this subject in his historical survey are well worthy of quotation. Quote, the ancient writers often mention instances of an abbot giving a plan which his convent assisted in carrying into execution. The edifices of religion owed their first existence to the zeal of the clergy. The more enlightened prelates invented or procured the plans and carried them into execution. But although from record as well as from probability, we may conclude that the arts in this age were principally cultivated by the clergy, it is no less certain that there were persons who practiced them as a profession. What that powerful order found necessary to promote by their own exertions, they did not fail to patronize in others. And to the common masons and carpenters who might be found in the different cities of France, persons of superior skill and intelligence, were added who were invited from distant quarters by the enterprising liberalities of the bishops. The superstition of the times and the authority of the church secured them employment and protection. They gradually increased in numbers and improved in science, till at length they produced the most able artificers from among themselves. France, in fact, at this time was not without professional artists, but they seemed to have been neither numerous nor eminent, and the clergy were frequently left to their own exertions and resources. Gregory of Tours, who flourished in the 6th century, speaks of several of his predecessors as if they had superintended the building of their churches, particularly Omedius, who rebuilt the church of Saints Gervais and Protasius, and began that of St. Mary. And he expressly affirms that Leo, Bishop of Tours, was an artist of great skill, particularly in works of carpentry, and that he built towers which he covered with gilt bronze, some of which had lasted till his time. One general spirit indeed seems to prevail among the French bishops of the 6th century to establish new churches and to improve the towns of their dioceses. End quote. The progress of architecture in the 7th century under St. Eloy or Eligius, and during the reign of Clothair II, has already been mentioned. In the 7th and 8th centuries, the mode of building and the artistic taste of the builders remained about the same as in the 6th, but the features were somewhat enlarged and enriched. The towers and belfries became common. In the 9th century, architecture and operative Freemasonry received new strength under the fostering care of Charlemagne. The buildings erected in his reign exceeded in taste and extent the works of preceding kings. There was a better contact with the East and with Byzantine artists. Italian architects were brought from Lombardy, and the monuments of ancient Rome were imitated. The nameless monk of the monastery of St. Gall, who wrote the Gest de Charlemagne, in describing the cathedral of A. la Chapelle, which was erected by Charlemagne, says that it surpassed in splendor the works of the ancient Romans, and that for its construction he called together masters and workmen from all parts of the continent. Rebold thinks that the fact that Charlemagne had sought for builders in other countries is an evidence that they had become fewer in France. This is scarcely a sound belief. The king might very properly avail himself of the skill and experience of foreign artists without necessarily indicating by the invitation and use of them that there were none in his own country. 
The wrecks of the ancient Roman colleges were still remaining in Lombardy, and it has already been shown that there was a flourishing school of architecture at Como. Indeed, it cannot be doubted that the intercourse established by Charlemagne between France and other countries of Europe was very favorable to the progress and improvement of the arts. The number of artists was greatly increased, and they were supplied with better models for imitation. Charlemagne, says Simone de Sismondi, was one of the greatest characters of the Middle Ages. Contrasted with his contemporaries, he possessed all the advantages of a man who was a stranger to his age. As we have seen before his time, extraordinary men who have subjugated a civilized people by the energy of a character half-savage, so in him we see a man who, being in advance of the civilization of his times, has subdued barbarians by the force of his intellect and by his knowledge. He combined the qualities of a legislator with those of a warrior, and united the genius which creates with the vigilant prudence that preserves and maintains an empire. He drew together in one chain barbarians and Romans, the conquerors and the conquered, and united them in a new empire. He laid the foundations of a new order for Europe, an order which essentially reposed on the virtues of a hero and on the respect and admiration which he inspired. Such has been at all times the concurrent opinion of all historians with the exception of Voltaire, and perhaps a few others. And even they, while charging him with unproved faults and even crimes, admit the greatness of his enterprises and the splendor of his reign. It is therefore singular that in the traditions of the early Freemasons he has not been permitted to occupy a place unless, as has been pointed out, his name has been pushed aside by a substitute. In the legend of the craft, found in the old records of the English Masons, the introduction of Freemasonry into France is said to be due to a certain Greek artist who had been at the building of the Temple of Solomon, and came into France in the times of Charles Martel, who patronized the craft, made Masons, and gave them charges. We may well note here an error as to the meaning of the name of this celebrated mayor of the palace, who without assuming the title exercised all the functions of a king. It has been the universal custom to derive the word martel from the French marteau, which signifies a hammer, and it has been supposed that he obtained the name from the fact that he crushed the barbarians with whom he fought as with a hammer as potent as that of Thor. And so it has been very usual with English writers to anglicize his name as Charles the Hammer. But Monsieur de Feller, Biography Universelle, a very competent authority on French etymology, has shown that Martel is only another name for Martin, that Martin was a familiar name in the family of Pepin, of which Charles Martel was a member, and that it was adopted in the spirit of devotion to St. Martin, who was then the favorite saint of the Franks. We must, however, in fairness, admit that Monsieur Michelet, History of France, an authority as good, at least, as Monsieur de Feller, recognizes the current derivation from Marteau, which he thinks referred to the hammer of the Scandinavian god Thor, and he is therefore of the opinion that Charles was not a Christian. The gross mistake of making a workman at Solomon's temple a visitor at the court of Charles Martel at once exposes the great lack of information and the liability to error of the original composer of the legend. It is not, therefore, at all improbable that he confounded Charles Martel with his grandson, Charlemagne. It is very evident that the spirit of the legend does not apply to Martel, who, during his official life under two feeble kings, was fully occupied in wars with rebel subjects, with the Saxons on the north and the Saracens from Spain on the south, and who had neither time nor taste to devote to the arts of peace. The monks, who were the principal builders, were not his favorites, and St. Boniface has not hesitated to call him the destroyer of monasteries. It is hardly to be doubted that he destroyed more than he built. Charlemagne, on the contrary, was, as we have seen, the patron of the arts of civilization. He might, with but a little stretch of imagination, be called the founder of operative Freemasonry in France. His contact with Byzantium and the East gives color also to the legend that he was visited by a Greek architect, which is simply a symbolic expression of the idea that Byzantine architecture and Greek art and culture were beginning to be introduced into France and the West during the period when Charlemagne reigned. We may, therefore, very safely correct the English legend of the craft by substituting the name of Charlemagne for that of Charles Martel. Louis the Feeble, the son and successor of Charlemagne, though as the nickname bestowed upon him means a prince of no force of character, yet favored architecture, and in his reign many religious structures were built, 
under the superintendence of his architect. The name of this artist was Rumalde. We know scarcely more of him than the fact that he was an architect of Lewis. Whittington thinks it probable that he was not a churchman official of high priestly position, since it is clear that he practiced his art as a profession, and architects doing no other work were at that time becoming common. The universal belief that prevailed in the 10th century, in the near-at-hand destruction of the world, the coming of the millennium, and the day of judgment, had naturally the effect of paralyzing all industrial arts, and architecture made little or no progress. During the 11th century, there was a revival. The records of that period contain the names of many distinguished architects who were not monks but professional men of business. Freemasonry had for some time been passing away out of the hands of the officials of the church into those of the laymen and the guilds. The guilds, or trade corporations in France, began about this time to take an active existence and to exert a powerful interest on the progress of the arts. The consideration of their history is well worthy of a distinct chapter, but our attention must now be turned to the early history of Freemasonry in other countries. All right, and that's it for this week's round. We will pick it up next week with Chapter 50, Early Freemasonry in Britain. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a comment. We enjoy hearing from our listeners. If you really like what you heard, share this podcast with your friends and lodge members. Visit us online at solomonstaircase.org.